Welcome back everybody, Steve from the Pinball Room, finally coming back at you with another video. Um, we're like a month behind schedule, I'm sorry, I feel horrible. Had to go through and insulate my garage because we had a cold snap out here in Utah and it's just freezing, could not work in my garage. Um, we're now at a, a balmy 52.4 degrees, woo! You can probably hear the heater run in the background, but it is a good solid 10 degrees warmer than it was and 50, 52, 53 is way better than 42, right? Um, yeah, so things have just happened, but like I said, we're a month behind schedule now, so we got a lot to get done. Our schedule for a show is going to be June 4th at the Northwest Pinball Arcade Show, I think is what it's what it's called, out of Tacoma, Washington. There's going to be a lot of homebrews there. The guys from Fast Pinball, Aaron Davis and others, um, that have the hardware controllers I'm using. They're going to be there. Um, I'm going to be there. You should be there. If you're in the Western U.S., come join us. Um, there's also supposed to be a Golden State Pinball Festival, I think, coming up around a similar time out in California. It's about the same distance for me. I'm going to see if I can hit both of them, hopefully. So stay tuned on that. Okay, but enough of that. Today, we are going to work on the magic mechanical wonder that is the pinball pop bumper. Yay! All right, so we're going to take a quick uh, trip down memory lane and kind of talk about the origins, the assembly, and the usage of this over the years. And then we'll fast forward into how we're going to integrate this into our current homebrew. So for those of you who are not familiar, this is the pop bumper assembly. This is the same assembly. This is the Williams version you can order from Pinball Life. Thank you, Pinball Life. You guys are awesome. I highly recommend them. Um, and it, it's the, the complete mech you can get. And like many things we see on Pinball, how does this mech work again? Our wonderful master, electrician, early father of Pinball, Harry Williams. Correct me if I'm wrong, Google. I believe it's Harry Williams uh, that invented this back in, I want to say, the 1940s. I believe this was really pretty much the first true full Pinball mech that was created. Not to discount the solenoid, the basic solenoid he created. That was the very first really electronic device that was added to a pinball machine, if I'm correct. And if you remember, the original pinball machines, they're like Plinko machines, right? The bagatelles, the small box with some nails or pins, and the ball would go up and kind of bounce around and eventually go inside a little hole, and that's how many points you got. And then Harry Williams came along, added electricity, added a solenoid with a little rod by those holes or underneath them. So if a ball went into those holes, he would kick it back out, the ball would keep going. You could make it into multiple holes and get multiple points before it came down and settled. And then Harry invented the pop bumper, which I'm sure at its time had to have been seen as just like absolutely revolutionary. I mean, imagine you've got the simple little uh, toy, right? Box with the ball coming down through these pins, goes in a hole, pops out. And now all of a sudden you have these weird little jobbies that are there. And whenever the ball hits the side of it, it gets, gets um, shot back out the opposite direction again. And these are kind of kicking the ball back and forth. And not only does it change the direction, extend the ball time, but it accelerates the ball also. So Wow, a whole nother level of fun and energy. It had to have completely, you know, reimagined the game of pinball for everybody back then in the, in the 40s and 50s, right? And we've seen this used over the eras. I mean, this is like these stalwart. We've not changed this hardly at all. I think this exact mech has pretty much been unchanged like the last 30 years. But even the concept of a pop bumper or jet bumper um, has been around for what now? We're talking like 70, 80 years. So, I mean, it stood the test of time. Can you think of a pinball logo, a graphic t-shirt, um, signage and logos for pinball expos, um, pr trophies for pinball leagues, anything that doesn't have that iconic, um, you know, graphic image of a pop bumper. It's, it's so a part of pinball that it's hard to imagine pinball without it being somewhere, right? And yet, there are some different camps, schools of thought starting to form, it seems like. Uh, myself, one of them as well, that some people are kind of questioning just what is the value of a pop bumper? You know, if you don't include one on your machine, are you just you know, totally being blasphemous. And how would you not have a pop bumper? You need to have pop bumpers. Other people I think are kind of like, what do they really add? Um, to today's more modern games where we're wanting more complexity and more depth in games. I think it all just depends on the game. I think they can be a lot of fun. I think they can add a lot to a game. But I do think, and again, perhaps recency bias for those of us who have been in pinball for the last, you know, couple of decades, I think that the way that um, some pop bumpers started to kind of get relegated to a, a kind of a fixed, consistent placement and usage in games from the early 2000s, from the Stern Pinball era, um, I think it's kind of made some of us feel like, eh, maybe we're kind of getting tired of them. But more recently, we're seeing a lot more um, ingenuity, a lot more um, uh, diversity in how pop bumpers are being integrated into, into machines, which I think is kind of starting to breathe some life back into them and making people realize, okay, there is value and purpose for this mech. When you think about it from like, you know, the electromechanical age um, up through until about the golden age of pinball, pop bumpers 
there were some varying locations and setups where they were in. Think of some of the most popular games, Twilight Zone, Adam's Family. You had pop bumpers. You usually had them in like clusters of three or four, perhaps even five. I'm not sure what the record is for the most pop bumpers in a game. Somebody I'm sure can put that down in the comments for us. Is it more than like nine, eight or nine? That possibly, I have no idea. But um, the way that we saw them used kind of in the, in the early 90s, mid 90s and, and the early 2000s of Stern after the kind of the demise of the heyday of pinball coming back and thank you Gary Stern for keeping it alive. I'm well, so thankful, we all are. Um, but there was a period of time with those Stern games like Stern Star Trek and, and several others where I, I feel like we started to see the pop bumpers kind of always being done in the same way, right? Where we had a cluster of three and kind of like a, like a triangle format, right? Upside down triangle where we'd have two or three of them up here at the top right of a play field and there'd be some rollover lanes, right? And we'd have our, our skill shot where we'd plunge back, a control gate would stop the ball, we'd go over, um, over one of these rollover switches through a lane, and we'd hit the pop bumpers, it would bounce back and forth between the two, eventually fall down to the third one, and eventually gravity would bring it down, and, and there you go. And sure, some games would integrate it into the, like the modes, hey, shoot the pop bumpers, go back up to your orbit, have the control gate stop it, it'll fall down. But I feel like that just kind of maybe got overdone for a little while. So I, mean, I think that's my opinion. That's what's caused some of us to kind of be like, eh, pop bumpers, do we need them? Eh, there's probably better things we could do. Well, I think there's lots of examples, especially modern um, examples of how pinball um, pop bumpers have been changed and their location and their integration. And I think it shows how cool they are still as Max. Scott Denisi, first one that comes to mind. Not only with his more recent um, game of Rick and Morty, where he took the pop bumper and he replaced the lower left slingshot entirely with a pop bumper. So you had the same type of like lower third interaction, but it was not the symmetric you know, type of interaction we're used to. Now you have a pop bumper that's rounded, different angles the ball can hit, different angles the ball can be, can be shot back out at us. That was fun and different. Some people liked it more than others. I thought it was just great that he was trying something different. I enjoy it. Um, what else? on his Total Nuclear Annihilation. Scott Denisi also. There's no pop bumpers up top. It's a more classic, flat, kind of old school type layout. And it was so fresh for all of us at the time, right? We were so used to these other kind of like a ramp, an orbit. He changed it up and he brought back kind of like an old school layout that was so fresh at the time. And if you think about it, his layout was really kind of taking the play field and dividing it in half. If I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but almost kind of like a, like a multi-morphic pinball machine, right? He split it down the middle, basically. Everything on the lower third was kind of open, but past that halfway point, you weren't really getting the ball up there unless you hit like an orbit or into the scoop and did exactly what you needed to do. And so it created this really fast-paced, chaotic sense of gameplay because the ball was always coming back at you so much faster than taking the time to go up and hit shots and come to come down. And I think we all, myself included, loved that. It was like, oh, kind of refreshing and different. And he had a pop bumper in an unconventional place. He had it above the right slingshot over here. And that added some more chaos. And it also was a shot you had to hit at a certain times. So you were forced to hit it. You couldn't avoid it. Um, so you kind of had to take that risky, dangerous shot. Um, Keith Elwin, one of my favorite designers right now. He's created what is becoming for me quickly one of the greatest pinball machines of all time. One of my personal favorites, Godzilla. He's also done a similar thing where he has a, um, a pop bumper up around over here on the on the right side above the, the slingshot a little ways. But not only is it there a shot for you to interact with, it adds chaos, but he's actually integrated so well. He's got a whole um, ball path going around and circling around behind the pop bumper. Doesn't even touch the pop bumper on the backside. It's nice and smooth, but it allows you to have a whole shot that can go over there and not interact with the pop bumper. Or on other shots from the other, other direction, you do interact with the pop bumper. So lots of fun ways to do it. All right. Enough on that. Let's catch back up to what we're going to do on our homebrew pinball machine with the pop bumper. I'm thinking there are two places I want to experiment and see if they make sense and add some fun stuff to our pinball machine here. First one is down here, similar to on TNA, but on the left-hand side, just above this left slingshot, I want to put a pop bumper here. So when the ball exits out of the orbit, we'll have a ball guide that will kind of curl it up a little bit and hopefully just skirt the edge of this pop bumper, hit that switch, and send the ball off into another direction versus just always calmly coming back to our flipper. It might be better to have it always calmly come back to our flipper to get that sense of flow, because I want to have a lot of flow. And having the ball return back to your flipper so you can take another shot is fun. So we might scrap this if we don't like it, but I want to try it. I want to try it because I think it'd be fun to see how the ball gets shot out, how that interacts with like the upper flipper or into the slingshots. 
when you are down in the slingshot, the ball is going around, it has a chance to kind of extend that interaction because the ball will come above the left slingshot and maybe hit this and continue its, its frenetic energy. We'll see. Could be stupid. We're going to play test the hell out of it and find out if we like it or not. Okay. The other spot is the old tried and true spot up here where people have their skill shots. I kind of have this void in here, right? And I really like the way this upper play field's coming together with our horseshoe, with our diverter shot, the, um, the Newton ball, the spinner into our scoop. I'm liking all of this. So I don't really want to change that um, to try to have like another path into that area. And we could just leave it for something static that doesn't interact with the ball, like um, a sculpted toy. It could be that's like maybe like where our 3D printed hermit figure is going to go or an Icarus statue. But I do want to try to find out some way to have that interact with the ball. I'm, it's just kind of the way I am. I feel like if you have a usable space on your pinball machine to interact with the ball in a way that's fun, you should do it. So the key is, is it fun? So we're going to have to experiment again. But I think, and originally I was like, is this kind of an original idea? Heh, no, of course it's not. There are examples where this is already being done. But my thought is to put a pinball, uh, a pop bumper, just a single pop bumper right here, that the pinball can come up and maybe there's a control gate that would knock it down in here and it'll, it'll hit some stand-up targets back here that are along this outer, this outer loop. And for a normal shot, the ball will go around and hopefully not trigger those shots. But let's say you do a, um, a skill shot. Um, I'm not a fan of the traditional skill shots where it comes up here and you can plunge it as hard as you want. It's going to come up here and bounce around. You pick the lane, it falls down through. So I want to have a few different skill shots. I like, again, like Keith Elwin has lots of skill shots in most of his games. So we're going to be able to short plunge and have it come to his upper flipper and hit some shots. Or we can do almost a full plunge and have the ball fall into this pop and hopefully hit those stand-ups, right? Or we might have to have a, a, a control gate to help make that shot be more, um, you know, easier to hit. We'll see. Now, I talked about an example. Many of you probably are already thinking of one, and there may be more than this, but the one that came to mind for me was Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz did basically the exact same thing, but in the bottom left corner of its play field. It uses this open space down here by the apron, has a single pop bumper with kind of a semicircle of stand-up targets around it. Those of you, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, right? And if the ball drains, you think your ball is done, but no, if it can interact and hit enough of these stand-up targets and light them all, you get your ball back, you get a chance to extend that ball and play longer. So same idea though, right? A single pop bumper that's trying to hit these stand-up targets. That's what I want to try to put up here and see if we can make that work. Again, it may not work all that great, but we're going to give it a shot. All right, so there's a little history lesson for you, a little idea of how we're doing it. The, the next step, I guess, then is figuring out how we're gonna actually going to go about integrating this in. So first thing first, we got to get our grinder, my favorite new tool. Thank you to everybody who recommended I get a grinder because it's going to be awesome. It's been saving my life. We're going to grind off an edge here, make it flat so we can get this nice and tight against the rail so it's not completely blocking this shot, right? We need to have it sunk in just a little bit. So we're going to grind that down. And then just like how the slingshot has kind of a unique hole pattern and there's like templates and stuff people can use to drill those out to make sure they, they work good. The pop bumper has a similar thing with all, all these rods and things that need to fit down underneath and go through the play field. So here's an awesome template I found that I was able to 3D print out that we're gonna use that has a template for all the holes we need to drill, okay? I've got a link for this down below in my notes for my video. I got this off of pinballmakers.net. It's a great wiki. It has a lot of good things about helping you make your own homebrew pinball machine. I highly recommend you touring their site and reading through it. Then there's an STL file down below you can grab to then 3D print this. There's also a, um, a, a, D, a DWG file, I believe, and there is a PNG. There's a few different versions you can print this out and like, you know, put it on paper and trace it out, etc. So, but those are the holes we need to make. So we get the pop bumper right here. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's try some grinding. Pretty straight. 
to defile the hell out of it, but otherwise. All right, there we go. I'm pleased with that. All right, there we go. We got the pop bumper installed. Everything's working good. Um, I'm gonna need to probably adjust this and rotate it a little bit to make a little bit more space for the switch is right against the edge right now in the final version. That'd be too close inside of the cabinet. So we'll tweak that in our next white wood and rotate it just a little bit. And then uh, next video we'll go through, we'll get the other pop bumper in and the stand-up targets and get that set up. And after that, <clears throat> after that, it's back inside where it's warm. We're gonna wire everything up and get power to it and do a whole lot of play testing. Thanks for watching, guys. Catch you soon. Bye-bye.